Okay, everybody, assalamualaikum. Uh, today we are going to do nicotinic agonist drugs, and in the later part of the lesson, we'll talk about the antagonist. Okay. Um, as you can see over here uh, on the uh, first slide, I have placed some pictures. I want to talk about them. First of all, there is side effects of nicotine. Okay. Okay. So there are side effects of nicotine. Uh, when we talk about central, why we are talking about central effect? Because of the reason nicotine can enter into the uh, central nervous system and can produce the effects, okay? Uh, because it's lipid soluble in nature. So it will produce lightheadedness, uh, headaches, sleep disturbances, abnormal dreams, irritability, dizziness, risk of blood restriction. When we talk about lungs, it produces bronchospasm. When we talk about muscular um, activity, so it will produce tremor and pain. When we talk about heart, so it will produce irregular heartbeat and increase blood pressure. When you're young, um, your body uh, mechanisms are so good and you won't observe these effects uh, that quickly. But later on in your life, you will definitely uh, go through these effects, okay? So please uh, try not to consume any nicotine. Okay, nicotine, in how many forms can we actually consume nicotine? First one is, like the first thing that comes in our mind is tea or maybe coffee. The second thing that comes in my mind is um, cigarettes right so we have to avoid all of these in order to get uh, in order to stay safe from the side effects all right now talking about over here you see if you look over here so uh, this is like one two three four five when we talked about the muscarinic receptors so we tend to know that they are working by the action of G protein coupled receptors, that is GPCRs. And when we talk about nicotine agonist drugs, so we tend to know that, okay, this is the flower like pentameric uh, receptor. Don't write flower like in exam. You have to write pentameric, okay? Penta means five, okay? Mer means part. So this is a nicotinic receptor, is pentameric. All right, if you look over here, so you will find that alpha is toys and rest are reoccurring the same in the same number. Okay, so uh, that's how the, the, uh, the nicotinic receptor actually uh, looks like. Okay, let's talk more about it. First of all, again, reinforcement, which I usually do in the start of my class, that is Cholinergic receptors, we talked about, we have two kind of receptors, nicotinic and muscarinic. We are going to cover up, inshallah, 50% of the nicotinic receptors today and rest of the nicotinic receptor in the next lecture. Uh, we have been talking for so long that nicotinic receptors are uh, further subdivided into NM and NM. NM means neuromuscular junction. When I, when I say neuromuscular junction, it means neuron and muscle. And there is a junction, there is a coordination uh, at where these receptors are located, okay? When we talk about muscarinic receptors, we got to know for so long that there are five kinds of receptors, that is M1 till M5. And we also got to know that M1, M2, and M3 are more abundant, okay? We talked about that M receptors, that is muscarinic receptors, actually produce impact by the action of GPCRs, right? When we talk about nicotinic receptors, so we tend to revise that there is no uh, second messenger involved. However, there is all about activation of sodium and potassium channels. When I say sodium and potassium channels, it should come into your mind instantly that action potential is involved, right? Now, 
let's uh, discuss this slide again. Previously, we have always highlighted acetylcholine. Today, we are going to highlight NM, that is neuromuscular nicotinic receptors. Okay. Wait a minute. Anyways, with him. Now you see over here, or at this space, the nicotinic receptor is there where in the somatic nervous system, right? Okay. In the parasympathetic nervous system, okay, we are having this N2 receptor over here. However, we were more focused on the N1 receptor today, which is the uh, neuromuscular junction, right? Okay. Wait a minute. Let me go back to the slide. So you see, when I talk about it, so this is N1, which was neuromuscular junction. And over here, we only found N1 over here, right? N2 is here. N2 is here. And two is here. My question could be, which is basically for the next lecture, but I'm asking today as well, uh, so that we can have reinforcement in my next lesson, that why exactly N2 is here? Look, ganglion N2, ganglion N2, right? Within the adrenal medulla N2. It means that it's very much um, clear to us that wherever there is a ganglion at that moment, we'll have N2 receptors over there. However, we'll have N1 at the neuromuscular junctions. Right, everybody? Okay. We have already discussed the structure, so I'll quickly move on. Okay. One thing I just have to mention over here, uh, we have already talked about that acetylcholine binding site is here. This is what kind of receptor? This is ligand gated ion channel, right? Okay, so you see, ligand would bind here. This is acetylcholine binding site. This is the docking site for acetylcholine. And then sodium influx would be there. When sodium influx would be there, it will go through all of the uh, action potential. It will release the action potential throughout the neuron and then remember we talked about calcium calcium would be there right and then it will produce muscular contraction okay so this is how it actually works before i jump into the details of the uh, nicotinic receptor agonist and antagonist medicines i want you to re reinforce this and keep this in your mind that by the action of acetylcholine calcium is released and then it produces muscular contraction. Because today's lesson would be more about muscle relaxation, okay? All right. Uh, then is, like I said, we'll first of all cover up nicotine agonist drugs, okay? So look over here, we have nicotine stimulant, which is, which is like, of course, nicotine, okay? What is nicotine? Nicotine is an alkaloid, okay? And it is lipid soluble, so it can die easily cross um, and enter into the CNS and produce the effects. So you see over here, nicotine-based product, which we also talked about in our last lecture, okay? Uh, these are also used in order to uh, inhibit the, um, uh, the, uh, the need of taking nicotine again and again. This is basically used for smoking cessation. Okay. Um, then if you look over here, so nicotine, like I said, it is alkaloid, okay? And it is lipid soluble. So it is agonist at both NN and NM receptor. And it activates autonomic post ganglionic neurons, both sympathetic and parasympathetic and skeletal muscle, um, a new, a muscle neuromuscular end plates, enter CNS and activates NN receptors, right? NN was the uh, neuronal, okay, ganglionic receptors. So medical use in smoking cessation, 
non medical use in smoking and in insecticides now you see oral gum patch for smoking cessation we have already talked about so i'm not talking in more detail about it when i say about toxicity so you see may, the mild toxicity could be that increased gi activity nausea vomiting diarrhea increase increased blood pressure high doses cause seizures and if we talk about long term use so it will produce uh, gi and cardiovascular risk factors and interaction they interact with additive with uh, cns stimulants okay so it means that you see nicotine is already uh, like making you go hyper so if you are going to take cns stimulants so definitely uh, you would face some adverse effects all right now coming up to the main uh, topic of the lesson today that is skeletal muscle relaxant my first question to you would be that at what moment do you think that the muscle needs to be relaxed what are those situations in which somebody wants the muscles to be relaxed when somebody is panicking maybe when somebody fell down may and the person has a bit trauma contraction in the muscle maybe the muscle relaxation is needed when um, a person is under uh, going through an operative surgery and the person needs to be relaxed the muscle needs to be relaxed right okay so skeletal muscle relaxant which is also the neuromuscular blocker drug which is nmbd okay we are going to talk about it so skeletal muscle relaxant skeletal muscle means the muscles which are moving are skeleton okay are drugs that act peripherally at neuromuscular junction muscle fiber itself or centrally in the cerebrospinal axis to reduce muscle tone and or cause paralysis right paralysis is the main target which we are targeting now right okay a muscle relaxant is a drug that affects the skeletal muscle function and decreases the muscle tone decreases the contraction okay it may be used to improve symptoms such as muscle spasm pain and hyperreflexia like i've just talked about the person has uh, uh, the muscles which are moving which are contracting again and again or which which are not in a stable condition so the person needs to take this skeletal muscle relaxant okay now when i talk about the classification of a skeletal muscle relaxant so we have a huge bifurcation of these drugs we have spasmolytics which we are not going to talk about today we have neuromuscular blocker agent which we are definitely going to target today when i to i just see on this slide i have two words in front of me after the neuromuscular blockers i have depolarizing agents or drugs or depolarizing neuromuscular blockers and i have non depolarizing neuromuscular blockers i want you all to refresh your memory and recall when was the last time we used the word depolarization if you remember we use this terminology when we talked about action potential right okay so you see when we talk about neuromuscular blocker when we talk about depolarizing agents so it's very much important that we need to talk about that what is action potential right we need to recall it so you see when the stimulus was there all right till it reached the threshold they were the failed failure initiations okay as soon as it hit the threshold value here there is minor correction which i have to make in the graph which is that it should have a slight bump before like this wait a minute 
it should have a bump before like this and then it should have an initiate initiation like that okay so let's revise depolarization what was that when sodium ions were uh, influxed into the cell membrane and repolarization was there when potassium ions were kicked out right and hyperpolarization was there when there was a lot of negativity inside the cell membrane so it went below the ne negative 70 value okay and then the resting state was achieved right and how exactly resting state was, was achieved it was achieved through the uh, sodium potassium pumps right if you have forgotten this the all of these concepts you can always go back and watch the video which i've already placed um, in the youtube playlist okay now you see this is succinylcholine the main hero of depolarizing agents because that's the only clinically important drug which we are going to talk about okay so first of all we'll talk about the physiology that how exactly normal normal skeletal muscle function actually works okay so what happens is this you see the uh, neuron is there exon is there which is covered up with the myelin sheet and everything okay and then what happens is this first of all nerve action potential was there okay and as a result the vesicle um, secreted the vesicle released acetylcholine into the synaptic cleft okay at that moment what happened depolarization increased permeability to sodium or potassium ion why it was there because there were the receptors which docked the acetylcholine and then the channels were opened and then sodium and potassium gained entrance right okay if i come back here again okay so here it says depolarizing depolarizing neuromuscular blocker non depolarizing right it is not saying repolarizing it is saying non depolarizing it means in one of the category we are going to produce depolarization and then we are going to relax the muscle now you should think that how come this is going to happen because we always talk about that whenever there's an action potential the muscle would contract but how come you are saying that uh, the depolarization would happen and then the muscle would relax right so we are going to talk about the entire phenomena and then there's non-depolarizing it means that this is the kind of a drug which is not going to produce its action by uh, you know uh, by doing some changes in the action potential it means that it is going to have some other pathway maybe by blocking something okay and then doing its action right so this is kind of have depolarizing have an action where action potential would be manipulated and then non depolarizing would be there where we are not even going to talk about the receptor and we are going to talk about some other way right so let's dig into it okay so you see how exactly succinylcholine works okay like i just talked about that they are going to have some other way so you see it's going to work by two phases phase one is this depolarizing phase what is going to do what happens what is depolarizing depolarizing was that when the channels were open and then sodium was in flux right so sodium is automatically going in right now when you would take succinylcholine okay so in phase one which was depolarizing phase there would be excess of sodium influx and there would be that much excess of the sodium influx that phase two would be achieved where desensitized ring phase would be there that the receptors would get so much uh, wasted out of passing out the sodium ions into the cell membrane that they would say okay i have given up and then they would desensitize we have already talked about what is desensitization so i am not digging into it so you see succinylcholine is a nicotinic receptor agonist right agonist when we say re nicotinic receptor agonist it, me it means 
that if uh, sodium was in flux like in one fold okay uh, one fold speed so definitely three fold speed would be there right okay is the nicotinic receptor agonist that acts at the motor end plate of the neuromuscular junction to produce persistent stimulation and depolarization of the muscle persistent stimulation means continuous stimulation thus preventing stimulation of contraction by acetylcholine right after a single iv injection and depolarization of the muscle there are initial muscle contractions or fasciculation fasciculation is also uh, like contraction okay in the first 30 to 60 seconds that may be marked by general anesthetics okay so you see phase one a lot of sodium is intaking right so definitely the muscle would contract right initially so this effect phase one's effect is usually masked by the anesthetic okay in the first 30 to 60 seconds okay because succinylcholine is metabolized more slowly than acetylcholine at the neuromuscular junction the muscle cells remain depolarized phase one okay and unresponsive to further stimulation resulting in a flaccid paralysis for the next five to ten minutes get it everybody phase one depolarization phase four phase two desensitization okay then with continuous long-term exposure that is for 45 to 60 minutes the muscle cells repolarize okay when they repolarize so you see here it was like positive okay here it's negative okay so they have repolarized however they cannot depolarize again while succinylcholine is present and therefore remain unresponsive to acetylcholine so this is the phase two that we are talking about here that now since they have a lot of negativity inside yes they have repolarized but remember we talked about the refractory period as well right so the thing is this succinylcholine is there right and it won't let acetylcholine produce its action okay one more important thing is this that if we take in acetylcholine is trace inhibition okay if we do that if we inhibit it so it will enhance phase one blocked by succinylcholine right but can reverse phase two block right what was phase one? Phase one was influx of sodium. Why influx of sodium was there? Because acetylcholine was there, right? Okay. So if you would inhibit the S trace, right? So definitely less breaking of the acetylcholine would be there. And definitely the enhancement of the phase one would be there, right? But it would reverse the phase two uh, block, okay? Okay, pharmacological properties, rapid onset, short duration of action. Action is rapidly terminated five to 10 minutes by hydrolysis by plasma and liver cholinesterase like I've just talked about. Uh, reduce plasma cholinesterase synthesis in end stage hepatic disease. Okay, so you see if some uh, like hepatic disease is there, okay, so we have already said that the liver is producing the cholinesterase, okay? So definitely if somebody is having the end-stage liver disease, hepatic disease, so there would be reduced plasma cholinesterase and reduced activity following the use of irreversible ACHE inhibitor may increase the duration of action, okay? Therapeutic uses, administration of the drug as an adjunct in surgical anesthesia, to obtain muscle relaxation while using lower levels of general anesthetic to induce brief paralysis and short surgical procedures and to facilitate intubation. So you see, the thing is this, that you use anesthetics, okay, more of them, okay, with them, and then uh, to obtain muscle relaxation, right? while using lower levels of general anesthetics okay to produce brief paralysis all right in short surgical operations it is used right succinylcholine okay adverse effects 
adverse effects so you see post operative muscle pain at higher dose um hyperkalemia hyperkalemia is another adverse effect where hyperkalemia results from loss of tissue potassium during depolarization right i have a message from a student okay um all right cobra i will uh, tell you after the class okay all right then is hyperkalemia results from loss of tissue potassium during depolarization right in depolarization remember potassium was kicked out and then so basically it in increase the uh, potassium within the blood okay emia means blood right hyper means more so risk of hyperkalemia is enhanced in patients with burns muscle trauma or spinal cord transection so hyperkalemia can be life threatening leading to cardiac arrest and respiratory collapse wait acha ji next thing is this a malignant hyperthermia hyperthermia is like more of the temperature okay so malignant hyperthermia is a rare but often fatal complication in susceptible patients that result from a rapid increase in muscle metabolism about 50% of patients are generally predisposed with mutation in skeletal muscle calcium release uh, channel of sarcoplasmic reticulum uh, then is malignant hyperthermia is most likely to occur when cysteine choline is used with the general anesthetic halothane it is characteristic characterized by tachycardia and among other manifestations intense muscle spasm that result in a rapid and profound hyperthermia so these are all of course when temperature would be there so the person's heart would beat more right and the intense muscle spasm would be there so you see all of them are linked together right okay um wait then is drug treatment is with dantrolene right okay then is adverse effect in adverse effect prolonged paralysis may increase in apnea apnea is like you have difficulty in breathing okay in a small percentage of patients with genetically atypical or lower levels of plasma cholinesterase so that is why you see when you have apnea so definitely mechanical ventilation would be necessary right then is bradycardia from direct muscarinic cholinoreceptor uh, stimulation is prevented by atropine uh, then is increased intraocular pressure may result from extraocular muscle contraction use of cysteine choline may be contraindicated for penetrating eye surge injuries then is um, cysteine choline produces increased intragastric pressure which may result in fasciculations of abdominal muscle and a danger of aspiration so definitely all of these are adverse effects are linked with um increase intake of acetyl choline and when you if you have forgotten what are the actions of acetyl choline so you can always go back and revise to that slide where we talked about the uh, direct effects of the muscular uh, muscular receptors where we talked about what kind of effects a lot of acetyl choline would produce right so that's why i just read this these slides and because i've already talked to you that so i'm not going into the depth of it okay all right everybody i'm um ending the class here right now okay i want you all to please join me back again okay so that we can cover up this because i have hardly 4 minutes here left and i want to cover up this topic as well okay